so nice to be here with everybody and feel the kind of energy that's building. Even though we're, you know, people are having cakes and tea and lots of chat, but still there's a kind of energy, I think, that's developing amongst us and a sort of momentum. It's really nice that you can spend so long. <laughs> so I thought we'd have um, space now for a question and answer session. Um, can be on any topic, related or not. Um, some people have asked a little bit about my project. I can talk about that if you like. But um, this is for you, not for me. So, you know, really anything goes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the question is, uh, the request is to say a bit about my project. So I don't know uh, if everybody's heard that... Uh, I'm actually in, I'm native to Chesterfield, <laughs> which is not very far from Leicester. But um, I've spent most of my adult life in Asia, actually. Um, and I ordained there about 11 years ago in Burma and spent the last, uh, well, I moved to Australia in 2012, um, hoping to actually arrive somewhere and stay for, you know, longer. Um, but about a year and a half ago, my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, asked me to come back to England and to <coughs> establish a monastery here. So he was basically talking about a place where women could take full ordination. Um, so training from, you know, a lay devotee, somebody who's just interested in the path and perhaps would like to discover more about monastic life or more about living in a, a context where there's spiritual friendship, chance to serve, chance to meditate and have a, a kind of taste of how that supports the practice. So um, being very devoted to my teacher and um, quite uh, <laughs> easily suggestible, I said, well, maybe I'll go back and just sort of see if anybody's interested. And I didn't think they would be, you know. But um, <clears throat> the first couple of people I, I mentioned it to were very, very excited and said, well, we've been waiting for something like this for a long, long time. Um, because there haven't been opportunities for women to take the full ordination in England so far. Um, so that kind of took me aback, um, and that was in early last year. Um, but I still didn't think much of it. I had my return ticket to Australia, and I was ready to go back in a few weeks. So I told Adrian Brown, and I said, well, you know, there's a bit of interest, but unless you're here, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'd need you to be here to give that sense of solid support, like a physical presence. Most people see that, yeah, something's going to happen. <clears throat> so I said, would you actually come and teach? And I thought, I know him quite well. He's going to say, no, I can't take invitations to Europe anymore, and I'm really busy already, overworked, underpaid, he always says. <laughs> of course, he's paid very well in terms of happiness. Um, but uh, to my amazement, he actually said, yeah, sure. I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> um, and he said, yeah, I can come uh, after the rains retreat. So that was sort of eight months on from the question being posed. Um, so I had no idea how to organize a tour or how to get people together who were interested. Um, <laughs> so... I, at that time it was just myself and I think we had the, a webmaster on board to help us uh, yeah, have a little bit of a, a social media profile but just a very simple website, I think it had two pages or something. Um, so yeah, what happened then? <laughs> it's hard to imagine. Well, oh yeah, then I thought, okay, we need a bank account because if we're going to have a um, tour then we're going to have to pay venues and, you know, get a kind of account. <laughs> so the next obvious step was that we'd need a trust in order to get a bank account. And we'd need a name. So that was quite important. And we actually chose the name Anukampo because it means compassion. But it, it's the normal, um, most common word used for compassion is Karuna. If anybody knows Pali, Karuna is used a lot. And there's many places called Karuna Monastery or Karuna Vihara. Um, but I like Tanukampa because this is you, it's a synonym, but it has this extra kind of aspect of empathy. So mm. it literally means um, resonating with compassion. Mm. So it's a kind of outward going, um, connecting sort of energy. And I thought this was very relevant um, and kind of symbolized what I feel the path should be and also where it leads. 
So we called it Anu Kampa Bikini Project, and then it started to sound very proper. <laughs> but still, people were asking me all last year, oh, so it's happening. And I said, well, it is in social media, but, you know, not in reality. Because <laughs> I had nowhere to live. So last year I had to put my time together, going from place to place and spending time in other monasteries because, I, you know, you can't just live in somebody's house for months. It's not fair to burden one person. Or, you know. And I need to keep in touch with um, my monastic friends for my own spiritual support. And so... Um, yeah, we had the tour with Ajahn Brahm. He came last October, and it all went really well. And some of you were there. Some of you even helped out. Um, and that was the first time I thought, my goodness, there were people here who were interested in this and wanted it to happen. And, I mean, there was one lady who um, ended up getting involved with uh, our legal um, status, you know, putting together the trust and working on our charitable application. And I met her recently, and she said... I had no idea. She said, um, you know, it's changed my life. Serving in this way has changed my life. I was like, really? And she said, yeah, it was just what I needed at this time. Um, it's been incredible for me, and I'll do anything I can to keep helping. Mm. And um, you're the first people I'm telling this to, but a month ago we put in our charitable uh, application for charitable status, and it's notoriously difficult to get registered as a charity. <laughs> Um, usually it's minimum three months until you hear anything and then a long process of answering various questions and but on the 12th of March we put it in and <coughs> on the 12th of April we got registered as a charity <laughs> so that was just a couple of days ago could hardly believe it um, so now we're officially a charity so I'm hoping that this will give us credibility and also keep us very focused on public benefit. Mm. So the charity is religious and educational. You can go for one or the other, but obviously it's religious. Um, although the Buddha didn't teach religion, but anyway, it's the closest <laughs> thing <laughs> to a religious uh, charity. And educational, because one of our main interests is to teach and to bring people in contact with the Dhamma. So, yeah, so this is the first step. Mm -hmm. spreading awareness, doing a bit of teaching, and eventually the main part of the religious uh, side of it will be having a place. where They call it a place for religious practice, so it'll be a physical place. And these are very rare in the world, and I don't know for anyone else, but whenever I go to a, a monastery, no matter how big, I just think, my goodness, thank goodness these places exist, you know, like little sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully we can develop a little sanctuary somewhere in England. And then we'll have male and female visitors. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of uh, people can come for lunch just to offer lunch to the nuns and to the guests. That's the kind of um, sort of lighter contact that you can have. There'll also be opportunity to come and stay for a few days. So that's the next stage. And then you could stay for longer, a month, two months. We might have um, stewardship places where somebody could come for six months, a year, and take care of um, the basic kind of maintenance and, you know, a bit like a secretarial role, steward for the Sangha. And then, of course, if somebody's really interested, for women, they can stay and take up the training towards becoming fully ordained. Not everybody gets that far, but, um, you know, even to ordain on the eight precepts for some time is a very enriching experience. Um, it's a big step. It's actually probably the biggest step because you're leaving the household life and um, take well, not really taking on a new identity as much as losing part of your old one. You know, first you lose the hair, <coughs> which is a major part of how we, you know, present ourselves in the world, right? And then you lose your choice of clothes <laughs> and wear these white sort of things, so you look like you're dressed up for Halloween. <laughs> and then uh, the next stage after the training in eight precepts is to take the novice ordination, which is ten precepts. And that's a bigger step because at that point you actually uh, refrain from using money. So this is when yeah, the renunciation goes fairly deep because you can no longer say, well, 
to cheer myself up, I'll go out for tea with my friend, or, you know, <laughs> I'll buy some nice shampoo. Well, you don't need any, but <laughs> body lotion, <laughs> whatever. You don't have any control, you know, anymore in terms of money. And even going from place to place, I mean, I can only come here because somebody invited me. Somebody collected funds for my ticket today. So you go where you're asked to go, and that's as far as it goes. So um, this is a, a really deep renunciation. And then the full ordination, I feel personally, maybe other nuns will tell me off for this, but I, I feel the main renunciation has been done, and then the full ordination is refining the conduct, refining it. So the precepts are very strong. There's no handling money, complete celibacy, etc. the five precepts. Um, and then the bikini training is like... Um, a further refinement of those precepts and a gradual restraining of the senses. So it's around little, smaller things. Some of them are quite big, such as speech. Speech is always interesting. So there are rules around um, um, not backbiting, malicious chatter amongst bikinis, uh, disrespect, things like this. So subtle, subtle things that we, you know, slip up on all the time. Um, and these are all separate rules. And then there are the more conventional rules, such as um, um, the way you use your requisites, so the robe and the bowl, and being mindful of that. So you need a nucleus <coughs> of a few for your day yeah. ones to start, um, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think we need more than one fully ordained nun to start because... The main uh, thing we need to start is a steward and someone to look after the monastics. <coughs> so um, this is the main thing. Until we have that, we can't really manage alone because we can't cook. That's yeah. another rule. Yeah. Can't cook, can't shop, <laughs> um, and need to have food offered. So that's the main thing. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any other bikinis who are, who are with me, and uh, I've sort of hinted it to one <laughs> other bikini <laughs> who I don't think will come over because it's a lot of work, you know, realistically. The vision sounds great, but it's a lot of work and it's, it's a great responsibility for you. Isn't yeah, it's a huge Correct. responsibility. Yeah. It's a huge responsibility. But I think um if I were to think of the whole thing at once I'd feel quite overwhelmed and I'd start to think I must be crazy. But um when you allow things to just unfold in their own time, it's it's different. Um, so we don't have sort of a time limit, um, and also because I've been asked to do it, yeah, it's yeah, kind of coming it. from yeah, yeah. something else. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ajahn Brown said to me one time, he said, "You've got my karma behind you," mm -hmm. you know, and it's that's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's a lot of trust, confidence, mm -hmm. um, and all his practice, you know. So that helps us to bring people in and. Gives me enormous support because I know it's coming from a good place. You so, said, uh, yeah. you can't cook. So <coughs> right. if, if dana is not offered to you, yeah. do you go uh, hungry? Now, yeah. these are interesting questions because it will depend on different nuns. Um, we're not supposed to cook from scratch, and there's actually a rule that talks about the whole process, such as um, harvesting the rice, pounding the rice, boiling the rice, etc., etc. So some people say that it. Uh, it you know, it's only if you do all of that that it constitutes um, a minor offence. Other people say one or two of those is okay, or one of them's okay. Um, for me, I would probably say uh, warming up food is okay, making toast is okay, uh, boiling an egg is probably okay. But it's more around like, are we just have you know getting involved in taste and thinking, yeah, I want to have curry today with coriander and ginger and a little bit of chili, but not too much chili and it's more that, and also um, that we are renunciants, and it's important to keep that contact with the laity, so it's a mutual um, benefit for both. So the Buddha said, you know, don't be hermits, for example. He said, you can't be hermits and just live off the land, because then you don't have to come in contact with the lay people, therefore they won't be taught. So this is the reason that um, we depend on each other. Yeah. One more question, sorry, yeah. uh, for the audience. Uh, in case if you are successful in uh, establishing a, a permanent residence in UK, have you when we're successful, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you will. Uh, you never know. Yeah, have you got any plans to uh, travel around the world, or you will <laughs> find to 
Uh, like I said, you can't really plan, yeah. but I think one thing that's always going to be important to me is to maintain my um, connection with Perth and with my teacher in Perth. So if he doesn't come, then he's going to get a lot of harassment for me to go and join him for the reins. <laughs> so I think um, I feel that it's important for us to have a stable base in England, but I also feel it's important not only for me but for the nuns that come, that they get exposure to other teachers. I mean, I'm just beginning. I'm not an Ajahn Brown. You know, I'm a student of Ajahn Brown, and I want them to have contact with him and other teachers, because not every teacher can please everybody. No. Um, so I think they need an exposure and I hope we'd be able to collaborate with retreat centres here as well and have some time, have the nuns going, say, to Guy House or maybe I shouldn't say that, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, wherever, for different uh, retreats. So I think, yeah, because the Bikuni Sangha is quite spread out internationally, globally, there will be some exchange, but probably not as much, not in the beginning stages, definitely not. Yeah, because we'll need to be present, so, yeah. So the rules you follow, um, which are half and brown, <coughs> did he sort of put together the rules, or did he take them from a different master or teacher? Or? Do you mean the um, ones I just discussed? Yeah. They're coming directly from the Buddha. So uh, these so are preserved the, yeah, in the, the Pali Canon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, yeah. 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 But, um, you know, just at a risk of not becoming dogmatic, um, I think it's important to understand that, yes, the rules came down, but the way they're interpreted depends on the teacher, depends on the individual. So I follow the way my teachers tend to interpret, but not because uh, I just want to follow, but more that um, I, they are my teachers because they understand things the way I do. So I incline to that way of interpreting things with a lot of wisdom and compassion um, and not always to the exact letter or not, let's say, to the extreme strict side, which some people like to do. That's personal. But, you know, not compromising, but with understanding why they're there, what the purpose is. Yeah. So who's going to come? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. At least two. <laughs> Three. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I got one question. Yeah. Uh, little I have listened to Ajahn Brown's uh -huh. uh, discourse. Uh, thank you. Uh, I Do you know want to come he in? has mentioned uh, in that uh, when he tried to establish the nuns monastery in Perth, he had quite a bit of challenge. You know, uh, have you thought about that? Uh, um, do you do you anticipate uh, no, obstacles? No, no, not really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'm naive. The question was that Ajahn Brown had some challenges when he tried to establish the um, monastery in Perth. Yeah. I would say it was more that the challenge was around his um, decision to ordain bhikkhunis. Mm -hmm. So in Perth itself, I think, yes, the nuns did face some kind of opposition, but it wasn't really within Australia, it was more internationally. Mm -hmm. So within Perth itself, there was huge support, and I don't think they faced obstacles within their community. Mm -hmm. It was very much um, a Sangha decision, you know, it was the decision of the whole community. Mm -hmm. So Ajahn Brahm didn't really miss a beat, actually. Um, he did what he thought was right. Yeah. Um, he got into trouble with the Thai authority, well, with his particular branch of um, Buddhism in Thailand. Um, so they delisted him. So his monastery isn't associated with their monasteries anymore, on paper. Um, but it's different for me, because I'm not associated with them anyway. So... Um, I'm not associated, I'm not disassociated. <laughs> I came in later, so I don't know. I don't really see it that way. And I guess I focus on individual relationships, so I have friends in different sanghas, bhikkhunis, non-bhikkhunis, siladhara, and I respect every, every vehicle for female ordination, you know, as long as it's used in the right way. Um, so I think if we can maintain that attitude of mutual respect, mm -hmm. Um, not trying to outdo each other or say this one's the only way or this one's the best for everybody. It's a choice. Mm. But I think women need the choice. You know, Women need to know that um, 
yeah, full ordination is available mm. if if they want to take it. It's their right. It's the Buddha's gift, <laughs> and it's what it's, it's what maintains Buddhism for a long period of time. So, yeah, I think if it's coming from the right place, people may criticise, but that's life. You know, they criticise you no matter what you do. So. One other naive question. Uh, it's not some of the others might know the answer. What's the main difference between the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis? The difference between the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis is that the bhikkhus are men and the bhikkhunis are women. I honestly think that from a spiritual side and, yeah. you know, because w- what we have here is all the bhikkhu temples. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think something that uh, we, we like to have, but is yeah. there any anything that we should know as being different, or is it exactly the same? How? Do you mean in terms of the precepts, or the vinaya? vinaya the vinaya. Yeah. Well, the vinaya is almost the same. It's not exactly the same, mm-hmm. but it's very, very close mm-hmm. in <coughs> a way that lay people wouldn't notice the difference. I don't think it would affect the lay people's uh, relationship, I think, will be, you'd find it to be the same. Uh, yeah, I think so. I so think you know, so. In the, when it comes to bhikkhus, yeah. they follow, I believe, 227 right. Vinaya rules. Right. So are there any, any specific number of rules? That yeah, we have 311. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of them don't come up at all. So, for example, you know, um, I will not teach somebody who is holding an umbrella who is not sick, or I will not teach somebody who is wearing shoes but is not sick. It's unlikely to happen these Mm. days. It would have been more likely in the Buddha's day. So some of them aren't things that you need to be particularly aware of Mm. in everyday life. Um, They're mostly the same. There are some particular ones just because they arose at the time of the Buddha, and so they were always put down to address a certain situation in, in that time. But the major rules are pretty much the same. There's a slight difference, very slight difference. Yeah. You follow the tale of the Buddhism? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can participate in uh, rain retri- retreats? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do rains retreats. We do do rains retreats and, you know, bikinis are supposed to be yeah. in, uh, you know, in one place during the rains retreats. With, there are some exceptions to that. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. If that's okay. Um, in some ways, I guess you're kind of almost at the frontier, and there must be other people like yourselves at the frontier yeah. bringing Buddhism to the West, however broad a concept that may be. Yeah. Buddhism throughout its history has interacted with different kinds of people and different cultures and has adapted towards them. What do you think the how how do you think Buddhism may adapt to being in the West? And yeah. something that I think about is, will it remain, will it remain coherent, or will it become so fragmented with things being will increased globalization, yeah. with pulling in things from different? Will we be able to recognize each other's dharma from one right. place to another? Yeah, that's really an interesting question. It's a big question and um, one that I also kind of contemplate quite a lot. Um, I mean, one thing is that I think the teachings are very transferable, so I do think that you can have it adapted to many different situations, groups, sectors of society, um, and it can benefit people. If, as long as they keep the main components intact, so that would be the precepts, the sila, ethics, mm-hmm. ethical conduct, and the practice of stilling the mind and the practice of insight. As long as those three are there, it's basically going to help people. Um, whether or not it's uh, what the Buddha taught, I think the only way you can really um, gauge it is by reading the suttas and kind of constantly referring to the suttas to see if you're on track with mm-hmm. those. So for me it's important to keep f- uh, referencing the Buddha's teachings and making sure my experience is somewhere in line with mm-hmm. that. Um, but definitely you can bring in like um, studies from psychology, for example, I find really interesting. Mm-hmm. So they do studies on things like compassion training and how it affects people's behavior. And it's so interesting, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. There are groups who do just plain old mindfulness, which is good in itself, but then other groups that do compassion as well, which is what Ajahn Brown calls kindfulness, and they find mm-hmm. that those people have a lot more ability to cope with suffering, a lot more altruistic motives, 
And it's just so interesting to see that what the Buddha taught is actually mm -hmm. a law of nature. So this is immutable, it doesn't really change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think some strands of Buddhism or groups who don't reference or read the suttas may be teaching things that aren't quite what the Buddha taught. I mean, if they're still benefiting and not harming, I think it's okay within that group, but then perhaps it's not very... Yeah. You might have to be careful about what you call it. And I mean, that, that brings me to another question that yeah. I actually brought to a group the other day, which is, if Dhamma is an objective truth, it's true whether you believe it or not. Right. Yet each of us ha are relying completely on a subjective experience. Um, how are we arriving at the same Dhamma if we're each <laughs> experiencing it in different yeah. ways? Yeah. It's a bit like yeah. the, uh, the elephant. Each yeah. people are feeling different right. bits of it and right. no one gets the whole picture right. of it because we're each coming at it from different yeah, yeah, yeah. angles. And we don't get the whole picture until we really break through and see the cause of suffering and the end of suffering. Mm -hmm. And that is the same experience, I think. But until then, we are all experiencing things subjectively. For me personally, that's where a good teacher comes in, somebody who I know has trod those steps um, <laughs> or who I have deep confidence in who has walked on that path. You can't always be 100% sure, but sometimes you just feel sure, hmm. and that's important. Uh, but their words should fit with the Buddha's teachings, at least there shouldn't be too much difference. Yeah. Um, personally, I trust that we are experiencing the same things, because most of the time what we're experiencing are some kind of form of um, the, the defilements, the hindrances, mm -hmm. and one or the other of the aggregates, or, well, all of the aggregates in different manifestations. Mm. Um, and I think as long as you keep the main principle in mind, like there's a sutta called the Mahapajapati Gotami Sutta, and it talks about, she asks the Buddha, um, can you give me some advice in brief so that I can go off and meditate alone? And he basically says, whatever dhammas lead to effacement, disentanglement, um, peace, wisdom, enlightenment, you can know that this is the Dhamma. Okay. So it's kind of which way it's yeah. going. So there's an element of universalism there Definitely. that can transcend in time, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think maybe the main difference is in how far it takes you. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you read people talking about enlightenment, and from my perspective it looks like an, a samadhi experience, uh, maybe an experience of deep meditation, but not necessarily full enlightenment. So yeah. it's still somewhere on that spectrum. But yeah. I think, yeah, it, it's important to always realise that we've probably only experienced part of the path, and not the whole thing yet. Does the language make a difference when, when going through that path, like uh, knowing Pali uh, or just knowing English? Um, I mean, there are really, really good translations nowadays, so I don't think everybody needs to know Pali. I learned some Pali. Um, I don't know the grammar very well, but I know the key kind of words, and that's helpful. You know, like words like Nibbana, for example. That's just an esoteric word for most people, but it actually means like... Um, it's the word they use for the flame going out, nibuti, which means like extinguishment, like the flame going out, and they used it that way in the Buddha's day. So that makes it very clear, it's a kind of cessation. It's not a place, it's not a thing, or a heaven realm, or anything like this. So, for example, things, key terms, I think it's really useful to have some understanding of the Pali, just to make sure that you know people aren't sort of distorting the meaning. But if you read the uh, main suttas, main... Uh, Majima, Digha Nikaya, and Anguttara Nikaya. They're translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi, and they're pretty good translations. Yeah. I mean, they're not perfect, but they're pretty good. Some of the words are a bit archaic. But, um, again, it's good to have a teacher who's um, practiced to a deep level and understands the suttas. Because, for example, when I spoke about concentration, I mean, I started to realize through my own practice that that wasn't the right word after a few years. And then Ajahn Brahm also says, well, it's actually stillness, and it doesn't mean concentration. So, in that way, it's good to have um, a practical interpretation. Yeah. There's one thing that puzzled me slightly, and that's yeah. just at the very end. Uh -huh. Because it mentions the jhana, the first jhana, yeah. mm -hmm. and it also says with it that if you experience the first jhana or the Buddha, mm -hmm. then, you know, then he knew that there would be no return. Right. 
but it, I thought the first child was very sort of low down on the level no, of achievement. No, it's not, no. <laughs> it's so, not low down at all. I mean, these days there's a big movement. This is a massive subject and I've only got about <laughs> one minute <laughs> if I want to stay on track. Um, <laughs> the, the jhanas seem to have been reduced in, <laughs> in profundity by some groups who feel that jhanas are essential, therefore they should be accessible, mm. and there are different sort of levels, it seems, yeah, of jhanas yeah, being yeah, taught. Yeah. So... Um, the real jhana is a state where there's no sense impact at all, like from the five senses, and um, there's a lot of letting go, and it takes a lot of foundational work, like we were talking about. Um, and I think also there's a quite a deep understanding of non-self comes from that, but it's not in itself, you know, liberation. But then it's you've got seven more jhanas to go. Well, you don't have to go through seven. <laughs> The Buddha Five. says, you know, that one's enough, one's <laughs> enough. I mean, <laughs> it depends on the individual very yeah. much, yeah. yeah, but it's not low down. I think the main um, reason it often in the suttas goes from the jhanas to the experiences of enlightenment is because the jhanas are places where you know that the five hindrances have been removed for a long time, and because of that there's a chance to yeah. see things as they really are without bias. So, yeah, it's that mind without bias that's needed. Um, to see more deeply into the Four Noble Truths. Uh, but it's that that, you know, is the enlightenment, not the jhana itself, as you know. Yeah. 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 But no, I think it's a high stage. Yes, last question. Um, nice to have you here. Thank you for the inspiration of my personality. Um, I'm just trying to understand a couple of your statements in your earlier talk that be helpful to lower down your expectations. Ah, uh, yeah. That's one statement. The other statement is to avoid self-deprecating. Oh, yes. And still don't understand and put them together. Right. What does it? Okay. Um, yeah, I never thought of it as t going together, actually. Perhaps we self-deprecate because we ha if you want to put them together, I can imagine that for myself, if I have very high standards of myself, which are unrealistic, I'll then start to self-deprecate. You know, I can never do it, I'm never as good as anyone else, other people can reach this standard, I can never reach it. And so that could lead to a lot of talking myself down, because the standard's just too high, you know, there's too much expectation and pressure. So I think the lowering expectation isn't about underachieving, it's just about um, not being so hard on ourselves, you know, and appreciating whatever we do and whoever we are without needing to be any different than we are. And that's an attitude that actually enables us to grow. It's not that you stay there. Once you actually accept yourself, you see your qualities, they grow. So I think you do achieve more. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that links it very well. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can I just... Uh, uh, yeah. Can you say something? There was a mention about uh, some courses coming up in, in London. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So say? there's... Um, yeah, this is where a bit of global networking is good because there are some bikinis in uh, America who I visited a couple of times and one of them is called uh, Ananda Bodhi and she's coming in June to teach with me. So she's a really experienced nun, she mm. trained at Amaravati mm. and they have a, a small monastery, well it's not that small, <coughs> they have a lovely forest monastery in America and it's the kind of model that I'd love to create. Mm. I don't think we'll get that kind of um, stunning scenery. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the Sierra Nevadas here, but yeah. Darvish is um, not bad, come on. <laughs> Darvish, yeah, Darvish is beautiful, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'll lady Bella. Yeah, yeah. We best be London. <laughs> so anyway, she's coming and we'll do an um, uh, evening talk and then a day retreat. Yeah, yeah. okay. I'm going to wind up with the Q&A because I really want to finish with um, guided metta meditation um, because I think this is, we've talked a lot about uh, understanding and investigation and dealing with the difficult but we haven't talked much, we haven't practiced much cultivation. So the Buddhist path is also about cultivating and metta is a wonderful place to start. So I thought we could end with some metta meditation. Yeah. I don't know if you need to stretch, there's not a lot of time to take a break, but if you need to go to the toilet, just go. Be kind to your bladder, otherwise <laughs> otherwise, just uh, stand up if you need to and then we'll...